welcome on stage with a tossing round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. I actually rejigged my entire talk this morning at 7 a.m. Uh, to be more inclusive. Uh, it's probably over long. Um, apparently we don't have a timing thing, but if you do have timing issues and I've gone on too long and you need to leave, I totally forgive you. Uh, the sloth is here for Simon, um, who requested it on Twitter. Uh, this is the sloth I wore at the Arthur C. Clarke Awards, um, which is part of Zoo City. So that's why you're wondering why there's a furry thing on the counter. So I want to talk about essentially the lessons I've learned in my career. And this is kind of the formula I figured out, which is success is 10% talent, 10% luck, and 80% pure stubbornness. Not an actual scientific equation, and stubbornness is not limited to include determination, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, more tears, uh, working with deadlines, blowing your deadlines, making it up to your editors, blowing through some more deadlines, more tears, chutzpah, rolling with the gut punches, self-care, hunting for inspiration, and oh yeah, doing the fucking work. <laughs> this is a swearing presentation, I hope you're prepared. This is a picture of me when I was five years old, when I found out that being a writer, can I get some water please? <clears throat> when I found out that being a writer was a job that you could have. You could get paid to make up stories for a living, and I was like, done, that's what I'm doing. It only took me about 30 years to get to be at the point where I could do that full time. That is me wearing the sloth um, at the Arthur C. Clarke Awards. I was, I think, 35. Um, so yeah, it, it, my five-year-old self would have been disappointed that it took that long to get there. But I've been doing pretty well. Um, these are my most recent books. I've just finished my new one. It's coming out next year. Um, I've worked in TV and film on Over the Adventures of Pax Africa. I directed a documentary. I've worked in kids stuff. I wrote the pilot episode of Zen News. And I've done some fun kids' books. I also worked in comics. Uh, I did a Wonder Woman comic set in Soweto. Uh, I've got my own horror comic with my best friend Dale Halverson called Survivor's Club. What if the 80s horror movies were real? And where are those kids today? Um, and then just some fun shorts and a really twisted take on Rapunzel, which I'll talk about later. My books have been published in at least 23 countries. Um, these are some of the different covers. I especially love the Russian cover of Zoo City. Um, which is here, I don't know how well you can see it with this resolution, but the girl is, is white, Zinzi is white on the Russian cover, and I don't know how they got to that. It's also the wrong kind of sloth, there's a major spoiler on the cover, it's just, it's a disaster. But it's really interesting to have these books arrive at my house, and sometimes I have to Google to see which languages they're in. Uh, these are some of the Shining Girls editions. I've also been, I blew my punchline, damn it. Uh, but. The Shiny Girls and some of my other books have also been optioned for film and TV. And this is a picture of me and Leo hanging out on his yacht the last time he was in Cape Town. Um, because his company has optioned The Shiny Girls. Danny Boyle wrote a script. Danny Boyle walked away from the script. And now it's with a very cool young writer. Um, and they're looking at developing it into a TV show, which is very exciting. I don't know when it's going to happen. These things take forever. Most film adaptations never happen at all. Um, so you get some free money. You get to talk about it. It's nice. And usually it's just kind of hurry up and wait. But yeah, totally got to hang with Leo. <laughs> but coming back to like this five-year-old who dreamed of being a writer, like this is what this is what I imagined when I thought about being a writer. <laughs> right? It's gonna be like super easy and wonderful. I was gonna be like the star of the show, doing like the solo trapeze action, just having fun, chilling in my garden, the ideas would just like flow, it'd be beautiful. And it's not like that at all. Um, creating is hard. It's really hard. And a friend of mine, Jason Arnup, has a wonderful saying about this. He says, writing isn't hard like being a firefighter is hard. Because that's, that's a real hard job, right? Writing is hard like being on fire. <laughs> And like for me, it certainly is. I know there are some, I have friends who can write really easily and it's a dream and it's just flow and happiness and so much fun and they get to like get through everything. I'm working through my angst on the page. I'm working stuff out. I'm holding an entire world together and just holding an entire human together is hard enough, let alone trying to like imagine other things. Um, so here are some of the things I've learned along the way. And this is, um, you know, to be, able to, to be able to write and to be able to write like really interesting stories that hopefully resonate with people. And the number one thing you have to do is you have to eat the world. Just eat it, like stuff it into your mouth, nom nom nom, like those donuts. Um, 
hopefully less fattening. So yeah, so be curious and be engaged and give a fuck about things. Like you, you actually need to care about things. Art is about engaging with the world. And if you're not caring, if you're not connecting, I, you're probably making something fairly empty. So eat the world. Uh, I was a journalist for a very long time. Uh, I got to do some really interesting assignments. Uh, one of them was hanging out with great white sharks. Uh, also teenage vampires in Cape Town. Uh, this is not a teenage vampire. That's High Court Justice Unity Dow, who's a novelist in Botswana. She was the first female High Court Justice in Botswana, and I got to do a really cool interview with her, uh, with photographer Peter Hijo, and that's his photograph. Um, I got to hang out with uh, the Peninsula Anti-Crime Association, which is an organization of ex-APLA and MK and other apartheid uh, struggle activists who have not been able to join the police, who have not been able to um, find proper jobs since apartheid. And they describe themselves as lions amongst the sheep. And they're like, well, if we don't patrol ourselves, if we don't like look after the world, then we're going to eat the sheep. So they'll, they basically, if you want to pay for justice, you can go and like, see these guys. Um, I've hung out with uh, homeless sex workers. I've interviewed vengeful women scorned, Miss HIV positive beauty pageants. And journalism was essentially a backstage pass to the world. It allowed me to connect with people, with other minds, with strange realities, with stuff that I wouldn't actually have ever anticipated. So yeah, also electricity cable thieves, I've learned how to make smileys, and another set which are sheep's heads, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, it's a great township delicacy. Uh, the cheeks are the best part. Um, I'm too squeamish a meat eater to do that. But the other South African delicacy I like to refer to quite a lot is the Cook Sister, because a Cook Sister is essentially a twisted donut. And that's what I like to do with reality. I like to go out and find lots of reality and do lots of research, do my journalism, interview people, talk to people, walk the streets, and then put a weird twist on it. So do something interesting with it. So once you've eaten the world, please try to poop out sparkling rainbow unicorn poop. Um, that'll, you know, that people can actually enjoy. With Moxieland, it's also like writing for me is a great way of like exploring social issues and stuff that I'm interested in. With Moxieland, my first novel, I was very interested in how we're controlled by our cell phones. Um, it came out in 2008, so it's actually a while ago. Um, I was interested in virtual worlds and how we were engaging with places like Second Life and these kind of other realities you could have there. I was interested in the police state and the ideas that were being used to ju justify a surveillance society, for example. You know, these terrorists amongst us. Um, and kind of combining everything. I'm missing, no, there we go. Uh, and, you know, darker is robot dogs. Uh, it's now Boston Dynamics. Their robots are terrifying, and it's stuff that I couldn't have predicted. I did predict genetically modified police dogs. This is a fake flyer we handed out at the book launch. Um, but the reality is just even more bizarre. I didn't predict Twitter. I didn't predict um, kind of crazy robot dogs that can hunt you down in the street or do backflips or open doors even after you've kicked them down. Have you guys seen these videos? These are terrifying. I didn't predict drones. We've got killer robots in the sky, you guys. Like, it's ridiculous. So the future is mad. So you can only like, do what you can with what you have. Um, but also something I predicted, uh, which I wish I hadn't, or at least I wish I had possibly patented, was that in Moxieland there's a big scene, it's a slight spoiler, I'm sorry, where um, everyone who's at an activist rally gets a text message on their phone saying, you've been infected with a horrible virus, uh, please go to um, the local police station to like, get this virus taken away. And that's quite similar to something which did happen in the Ukraine a few years ago, where activists actually received this message on their phone just based on their SIM card location on GPS, where it was, um, dear subscriber, you are registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. So just a really fun way in fiction to play with these really scary real ideas. I was asked to write a Rapunzel comic uh, for the Fables universe, which is part of Vertigo's adult um, comic line, which doesn't mean sex. It means kind of adult themed in terms of sex and violence and Game of Thrones level stuff. So I worked with amazing artist Yaki Miranda. We never actually met until the Edinburgh Festival a couple of years later. Um, and you know, we all know the story of Rapunzel, girl in the high tower, um, you know, uh, long hair. And I was like, okay, so Rapunzel's all about the hair and the tower. I'm like, you know what else is all about the hair? It's Japanese horror. And you know what's kind of an inverse of a tower is a well. So I made Rapunzel the girl from Ringu. <laughs> Which, and this is why research is amazing, and this is why you have to eat the world. 
So if you eat your hairballs, um, <laughs> that is called Rapunzel syndrome. If you eat your hair and you cough up hairballs, that's Rapunzel syndrome, that's the actual medical term. Um, this is actually based on the legend, the Ringu is based on the legend of Okiku and the Twelve Plates, um, which goes back to the 17th century Japan, and it was about a woman who was thrown down a well. There is something called the Okiku worm, which are thread-like hair worms that you can find in wells in Japan. So all of that just like came together so beautifully. So Rapunzel is Ringu girl with killer hairballs that can eat people's faces, obviously. <laughs> But I could only get to that point by actually like, being interested in all these other things and doing the research and finding fun ways to twist this. So real life is more surprising and inventive than anything you could make up. Um, I found this as a journalist, uh, especially you know, if you want to practice novel writing, one of the best things you can do is just kind of interview people or record conversations, obviously with permission, please. It's illegal not to ask for permission. Um, and hear how people speak and transcribe it and hear how people speak differently, how they express themselves in the world, the subtext which happens. And as a journalist, what you learn is the art of the pull quote, which is the, the quote that's in bold in the magazines, you know, back in the day when we still had magazines. Um, and that's a quote which says a lot about the person or the story. So that's what you're looking for in dialogue, is dialogue which isn't just, hey, how are you? How's, how's everything going? But something which speaks to actually what, you know, something which reveals something about the character. Um, with Zoo City, I, I, I went to Hillbrow, um, and I spent a lot of time walking around the streets. I w w went with a fixer, Johnson, uh, who was a really amazing guy, uh, an ex-Zimbabwean, um, now runs a security firm in Hillbrow. Um, and we spoke to people. We just walked around and we spoke to people, and we went into, you know, like cool places. These are all my f phone pictures from my cell phone back in the day. Um, and it was great. And being a journalist is one thing, because being a journalist, people are always like, oh, what's your angle going to be? Like, why are you interviewing me? But as a novelist, people are like, sure, come on in. Let me tell you everything about my life. Are you writing, are you writing that down? <laughs> uh, are you going to use that? And it's awesome. Um, so yeah, so we got invited into like, uh, High Point in, in Hillbrow and got to like, walk around and talk to the security guards who told us all about their life story and how they like, arrested a rapist in the building. And all of that stuff made it into the book, which was great. Um, their stairwell was out of order, and they had to toss rubbish down the side because the electricity kept going off in the building, which meant that the taps had flooded. Sorry, the water kept going off. Uh, view from the top. Uh, I also went because um, sangomas and traditional healing is very much part of the book. I went and spoke to various sangomas and consulted with them to make sure that I got it right. Um, and like this is something. This is like a perfect example of why research is so important and so fun, and it's, it's really important to go there. Part of the story is set, uh, there's a scene in the tunnels underneath Johannesburg, because they're all gold mining tunnels, they were digging for the cow train at the time of the book. And um, I went into, I did the, the rain, stormwater drain uh, tunnel tour that you can do in Cape Town. I couldn't do it in Joburg, but I managed to do it here. And it's, it's really cool, you go from Deer Park Cafe, and you kind of go in Wellington boots, and you climb down a manhole into the tunnels, and it's very uneven, and the, the concrete is kind of broken, so you're in your Wellington boots, and you're kind of wading along the side, and there's water dripping down the side, and there are white cockroaches, because they haven't seen the light. And I wouldn't have known to put that in the book, and I also wouldn't have thought to add this wonderful detail, which happened in real life, which was the guy walking in front of me, who was also part of this tour, tripped. And he went, ah, splat. And that's completely something which happens in the book, you know, because it's, it's just such a gross, wonderful detail. You couldn't make that up unless you went there. So go there. <laughs> um, speak to the truth. So although I make up really weird stories, um, I try to get at some aspect of reality. And I guess that's where inclusiveness comes in. Um, Broken Monsters was my most recent novel a few years ago now. Um, I was very interested in who we are on the internet and kind of internet mythology. This is a beautiful clip from an amazing Japanese movie, um, Paprika. And it's like, don't you think dreams and the internet are similar? They're both areas where the repressed conscious mind vents. So I was really interested in trolls. I was interested in um, kind of, I guess, the precursors of incel culture, which is young men who hate women. Um, and, and enact violence upon them because they can't get laid, because violence helps you get laid. Um, and, and also kind of the sexual bullying that was happening. And I was very interested in um, some circumstances where young women had got very, very drunk or been drugged or you know, encouraged to drink a lot. 
and then being you know, assaulted and then horrifyingly bullied in the States. And one of them committed suicide and the other attempted it. There's a wonderful documentary on Netflix about it called Daisy and something. Um, but it's just devastating. These teenage girls whose lives were ruined by the internet and who people are. So I wanted to kind of explore that. Uh, I was also very interested in like Slender Man, which is purely internet mythology. Um, you know, it's an urban myth that was completely fabricated for the internet of this very tall, faceless man in a suit who will come and kill you. And the year Broken Monsters came out, some girls, some 14-year-old girls decided that Slender Man was real and that they were going to sacrifice their friend to him. Um, and happily did not succeed, but, but I'm very interested in the way ideas catch hold in us. And kind of, you know, fiction as the doors to our heads and the doors into other worlds and into other people's heads. So I went to Detroit um, because it seemed like an obvious setting for Detroit and it was for the, for the novel of a place of broken dreams. And it was so interesting because we all know Detroit as this kind of like urban decay and these like beautiful abandoned buildings, ruin porn essentially. And I know it's that. But I also know that Hillbrow is seen as its own kind of ruin porn and it's not. Hillbrow and Johannesburg is vital and alive and people live there. So yes, there is this stuff in Detroit. Again, these are my cell phone photos. This is the Packard plant. It's like 3.8 miles of abandoned auto factory and it's gorgeous and it's strange and it's surreal and it's like being in The, living de the Walking Dead. Um, and kind of the ruins of our civilization, it's, it's very um, spooky. Uh, just weird abandoned buildings, so really amazing and really cool to like go into these places, breaking into places, worrying about what might happen there in this building. There were all these like black plastic bags of asbestos arranged around. And um, the guy that I was with, uh, yeah, you know, he was like, he's not going upstairs, it's too creepy, he's been there before. And I just had this terrible mental image of one of these bags standing up and walking towards us. And the only way out was we would have to climb onto a bookshelf and then climb back out the window. You know, this old, in an old abandoned movie theater, this one chair that had been pulled out like a rotten tooth from the row. Black squirrels jumping around in the grass. Again, just details you couldn't make up. This is the guy who showed me around, uh, Robert David Jones. I met him um, in a uh, pottery place, uh, with a historic pottery place called Pewabic Pottery. Um, and I, I had a friend's aunt driving me around and she was like, oh, let's go to the golf club. And I was like, please. She said, you can't possibly stay here, it's dangerous. And it was really frustrating. So I saw this cool guy in the pottery and I was like, please. I was like, I got chatting to him and I was like, can I pay you to, to take me around? Can I ask you to show me Detroit? So he showed me around, it was really exciting. We did all the kind of, you know, um, breaking into buildings and stuff um, and taking the art scene. And then the next time I went to Detroit, I had to do a research trip again, just to kind of back up the information I didn't have. And I asked him, renting a car, driving on the wrong side of the road, nightmare. So he arrives at the airport in this big black motor wagon. And I'm like, how well do I know this guy again? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I jump in and I'm like, hey, Robert David Jones. Nice motor wagon. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a motor wagon. It's actually a hearse. I'm sorry I was late, but I had to drop off this dead old lady like five minutes ago. <laughs> you know, this is too weird. I couldn't even put it in the book. It was just too weird a story. Um, but that was, so we got, I got driven around in a hearse, essentially. Um, I interviewed cool cops. Uh, this is a homicide detective who has also written a kid's book called Who Can, Baby Can. <laughs> I interviewed the world's hottest taxidermist, the terrible story she told me about um, a kangaroo, a, a full-sized male adult kangaroo that she skinned and then stuffed and then dumped the body outside and had the police knocking on her door is obviously in the book because it's too gold not to use. Um, I interviewed this amazing man, James Harris, and this is the first time I've actually used someone's details of someone's real life story um, in the book and I paid him for the privilege. Um, but he, he's homeless and he lives in Detroit. I met him working in a soup kitchen for the day because I wanted to talk to people. And it was really amazing to be able to sit and talk with people and ask them to tell me their stories and share that information. Hung out with Detroit teenagers. Uh, but it's also this bright, shining city. The art scene is amazing. It's really cool. Great architecture, music. Um, of course, Detroit is not just Motown, but also techno, the birthplace of techno. Uh, these crazy buildings with the Pewabic pottery. This creepy old kiln, which obviously had to come into the book. Mad art. So yeah, so I decided when I went back that I needed to talk to homicide detectives because my character is a homicide detective. Um, 
I eventually got hold of some people through Twitter um, and I met these two detectives and I was like, look, I'm struggling to get hold of, hold of Homicide. I've emailed them, my publishers emailed them, I phoned them, like I'm just not getting anywhere. And Mikey, the white guy, was like, cool, no problem. Picks up the phone, he's like, hey, Andrea, I'm sending someone to see you tomorrow. So the next day I picked up donuts um, <laughs> from the best place in Detroit. And, you know, I'd done a lot of research on, on like the, um, on the police station in Detroit and their headquarters, and it's this beautiful old building. This is where Bonnie and Clyde were arrested. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And like, I mean, look at those green lights. It's ridiculous. Um, this is Detective Kevin Kenneth, the Reverend Gardner. He's, um, he's known for his snappy dressing. He's actually wearing alligator shoes. Showing me around the precinct. I mean, look at this. It's just, it's like straight out of like a noir. It's gorgeous. These weird old cabinets, uh, cool stuff. This is the interrogation room, super creepy. But, and it's beautiful and perfect for the book. But you know what, the problem is, this isn't the Detroit Police Department headquarters anymore. This is. And I was like, no, I don't want to write about this. Don't make me, ugh. Oh. And it's Cubicle City. And they've got trade malls upstairs with TVs. And it's just, it's not as beautiful or evocative or cool, but it's the real Detroit. And South Africa has been represented so wrong so many times that I wanted to do right by Detroit as well. And I wanted Det Detroiters to be able to read the book and be like, yeah, cool, yeah. That's our city. So I wrote about the stupid, stupid cubicle farm. <laughs> so, you know, there's this, there's this idea that we can separate the art from the artist, and we really can't. Um, sorry, Michael Jackson fans. Sorry, R. Kelly fans. My daughter's an R. Kelly fan, or was, and she's really struggling with it. Um, your work is an expression of you, and what you put on the page is an expression of who you are. And art can be activism. With The Shining Girls, uh, it's a book about a time-traveling serial killer. That was my elevator pitch. Um, this is my murder wall, plotting out the timeline. Uh, it was very complicated. These are, that's the actual timeline, that's the historical timeline, and that's the timeline of the murders, and that's the actual woman who get killed. And I was supposed to kill more women, but I just couldn't kill any more women because it was depressing. And that's kind of what I wanted to, what I wanted to get into. So I went to Chicago, I walked around, um, Time Traveling Serial Killer, I could have said it in South Africa, but then it would have become an apartheid book. And Moxieland and Zoo City both deal with kind of neo-apartheids in their own way. And I wanted to look at how the 20th century has changed us and how especially things have changed for women. And I wanted to talk about how we talk about femicides. But also I wanted to talk about like time travel and what it would be like to be someone from the 1930s wandering around Chicago. What would be really weird? Car washes. Sneakers are weird. Those puffer jackets are weird. Um, Talked to a whole bunch of people. Uh, this is a uh, criminal defense lawyer. Checked out murder scenes. This is where the scene where Kirby gets attacked with her dog. Uh, and that's actually kind of uh, abandoned old houses. This would be the kind of house that allowed the character to try and travel. And kind of looking in the, peeking in the windows. Spoke to homicide detectives, went through their files. This is an actual investigation. I'm like, guys, this is so lo fi. <laughs> Um, we went through an old evidence box. We found all these crazy photos. Um, and it's just, it was just amazing. And like this woman, her photograph really struck me. I don't know what her story is, but this, she was just in the evidence box. But she seemed to kind of speak to me and what I was trying to write about because there's something in her eyes. There's like a defiance. There's, there's something. Maybe she's just drugged on morphine. But, but it kind of spoke to what I wanted to do with the book, which was writing against this stereotype of serial killers as the fascinating, diabolical, evil genius who's so sophisticated and so interesting. Because the serial killers are not. They, they, are, they often have low IQ, they're very violent, um, they don't have interesting lives, they're often sexually impotent, they feel impotent in their lives. They're broken, pathetic little men. And when we glamorize them, and we glamorize people they kill, it's, it's, it's awful. And that affects the way we talk about femicide in general. And I think, you know, just as The Shining Girls came out, there was this new story which broke. The first one was about Anine Boysens, um, who was murdered and raped in a very brutal and horrible way. And she only made the news because she was poor and black. Um, and because, the, you know, because she was poor and black, she only made the news because of the brutality of what was done to her. And I actually have a friend who worked at a major news channel, and she sent out a reporter to cover it. And the reporter was like, oh, you know, like another rape and murder? Like, and she was like, no, and these words have always stuck with me. She said, this rape is special. 
And that's how we talk about femicide. That's how we talk about like brown bodies in particular. Uh, the next, within a few days of that, uh, we had this happen, which was, of course, we have a steering comes murder. And this made the headlines, and this is the other way we like to talk about femicides, as the sexy blonde heroine model celebrity. And this is, this is how we talk about victims. She was actually a law student as well, um, and that just got, for the first 24 hours, they only talked about her as his girlfriend. And her name only broke out like 24 hours after that. And of course, Anine Voices didn't even get that. That's the only photograph we have of her. So I wanted to write against that specifically. So you can, you can write from anger, and you can maybe do something with that. I've had, I don't know how much impact it's had. It's a, it's a book. But I've had at least three people come up to me in the last five years and say, listen, something happened to me. And they'll usually wait until the end of the day. They'll come like right at the end of the event, and they'll come up to me after everyone else has spoken to me and said, Something happened to me, and I just want to let you know that you got it right, and I really appreciate that. And that's really all I can hope for and try to do. Okay, more fun stuff. I love collaborating with people because other minds are freaking amazing because they're unlike yours. This is a, a panel from our comic um, Survivors Club about Chen Zira, who's a Zimbabwean South African, who's a video games expert, and she's hitting the road solo to take down the monster by herself. And you can do that. You know, as a novelist, I have to do that all the time. It's awful. But you can also play with your friends. So instead of being the solo trapeze artist, you can work with other people who can throw you higher. Uh, I started with Urbo, the Adventures of Africa. <laughs> sorry, Urbo, the Adventures of Pax Africa back in 2005. It was South Africa's first full-length, half-hour animated TV show. We had a killer writing team. Um, not pictured are Tomiso Tsukudu and Greg Cameron, uh, but that's Sarah Lutz, who's since gone on to be a major writer herself, and Sam Wilson who's also a novelist now. A um, whole bunch of crazy animators, and we just, we just had like, so much fun. We had really great actors who like, brought the characters to life. Um, and then the art of collaboration, so Pax's little sister, little, bro little sister was originally a little brother. And I was like, guys, we need like, some female representation. So we made him, made him a little girl, Tita. And then one of the animators, um, Tyrone Herring, decided that she, he, she would, he would put her in a bear suit. And I was like, but Tyrone, what is, what is this white stuff around, like, is that lace? And he's like, oh, no, no, it's a rabid bear. So um, that's actually, it's frothing in the mouth. It's from, <laughs> so based on that, we created a whole character called Frothy the Bear. Um, and there's Frothy. Um, and he's just a terrible, awful character, very crusty the clown, which led to our best episode ever, which was Frothy the Bear dressed, so a guy in a bear suit, in a shrimp suit, he's Toothy the dental shrimp taking on one of our other characters who's Evil Pluck. And that's, I mean, that never would have happened on my own. I wouldn't have come up with, I mean, that's just mad. And that's what's great about working with other people. So it's very important to choose your collaborators carefully. This is my favorite collaborator. <laughs> it's my kitten Ivy. Uh, she's now a full grown cat. Um, but when Dale and I were writing Survivors Club, it's Dale and I, and that's just Dale. Um, she would we, she would be involved in deci in decision making. So we'd say, okay, Ivy, like which plot aspect would be better? Like pat your paw and like whichever is like you know the better thing for us to do. And so she would really be very helpful there. Um, also get stuck in trees, which was very useful for being distracted from writing because writing is hard. Uh, Dale is an award-winning cover designer. He's done all my book covers um, and some really other amazing ones as well. And we're both super horror fans. We've been friends for about 17 years. And I was pitching and pitching and pitching on like new comics, and I just wasn't getting anywhere. And he's like, you know what? I've got an idea for you. He was like, he'd been watching Child's Play, and he was like, what happens to those kids when they grow up? What, what kind of trauma and PTSD do they have? Like, we never see that. And that's how we came up with the pitch for Survivors Club, which I literally pitched, not in an elevator, but in the corridor of DC Comics to Shelley Bond at Vertigo. Um, it became this. Here are some of the pages and some of the characters. We, we basically mashed up every horror genre from J-horror to kind of the serial killer best friend to the living doll um, and like the haunted video game. We also got to play together, which was so much fun. So like we, this is, we're literally playing with action figures. We had to work out the choreography of a major scene to write it down to like explain to our artists what we were doing. Uh, we would also act stuff out. This is Dale playing Mr. Empty, who's our scary serial killer, getting the pose right. Um, improv lessons were very useful. Um, I also got to draw. Here's some of my drawing. Um, luckily, I wasn't the one doing the final art. That's Dale's version. 
And then that's our actual artist, uh, Ryan Kelly. And the monster is basically Gamergate, the monster. Um, so yeah, and, and the nice thing about like working with your friends and leveling up other people is that you get to share in your success. So we got to go to New York. We're hanging out with the founder of Love and Rockets, which is one of my favorite comics growing up, Hernandez. Uh, and Shelley Bond, we're at a comic store, like doing a signing, and there are four people there. Aww. So you also get to share in your failures, and it's okay. It's fine, because it's hard. So which brings me to Get Over It. This is my brain scan. Uh, and you'll note this problem point here. This is where my asshole in a critic lives. <laughs> I don't actually know where my asshole in a critic lives, but somewhere around there. I don't even know what part of the brain that is. And it's not my brain scan, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so get over it. Like, get over yourself. Take the work seriously, but never take yourself seriously. Um, or too seriously. Here I am reading my Wonder Woman comic to my kid, Kitu. She, she really keeps me on the level. She's hilarious. And a little while ago, she said I could show you this picture. So she's a badass. She's got great taste in snakes and like skeleton onesies. Um, but recently, I, you know, I was really struggling to finish my new book. And she was like, Mama, why is this book taking you so long? Three years. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just really struggling. And I told you the plot thing. And now I fixed the plot thing. And she's like, do you need help, Mama? And I was like, yeah, you know, actually, maybe I She's like, because no one can help you, Mama. <laughs> I was like, damn, child. <laughs> but you know, she was right. No one could help me. You know, and I do have an incredibly supportive network. I've got really amazing friends. I've got great editors. But no one could write the book except for me. So you've got to get over it. You've got to get over that inner critic. You've got to get over the self-doubt and the loathing. And it doesn't get better no matter how successful you are. I think it gets worse the more successful you are. Uh, I do hold closely to the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that um, the more competent you are, the more self-doubt you have, because you're more aware of how much you don't know. So I'd like, I'm just going to believe that I'm all the self-doubt and all the brilliance, right? Um, but I do think that's very helpful. I think what's also helpful for me is understanding that when we eat the world, when we read, when we look at art, and when we take stuff on, and then we do our own thing, we're comparing ourselves to the standard of what we like. And you know what? I'm not Margaret Atwood. And I'm never going to be Margaret Atwood. And that's OK. I just need to be me. And I need to focus on my work. And mental health. Look after yourself. Um, there was a great article on Lifehacker recently about the guy who tried all the nootropics, which are the fancy brain drugs. Um, so Ritalin and Adderall and Provigil, Modafinil. And he was like, you know what I found out works? Getting enough sleep, exercising, eating well. I hate to tell you there's no poll that's going to do it for you. I would add, like, see friends, and then do the work. Because you can't be fooled with self-loathing because you're a failure if you've actually put the stuff down on the page. <laughs> so give back. Um, I've always tried to give back with my stuff. Uh, we've done a charity art show or art fundraiser with everything. With Moxieland, we did Moxie Monsters. We raised 18,000 Rand for... Um, Sorry, 10,000 Rand for this group of women in Montague. Zoo City Bears, we raised 18,000 Rand working with original South African artists to create a, a vinyl toy bear somehow inspired by the book. And that money went to an amazing refugee kids' charity in Hillborough. The Shining Girls, we went bigger. We had an art show with, uh, we raised 100,000 Rand uh, for rape crisis. We got artists, we ripped pages out of the book and we got artists to like do whatever they wanted on it. They could put down their coffee cup and just sign it and it would be fine. And that, so that raised a whole ton of money for the um, for rape crisis. And the show actu actually sold out in 20 minutes. We had a queue down five flights of stairs for two hours before we opened the door, because you were only allowed to buy one artwork. And then with Broken Monsters, we did uh, we raised 350,000 rand with help from Nando's um, for Book Dash, which is an amazing organization which helps create original kids' books for South African kids. Their dream is that every child should have 100 books of their own by the time they're five years old. And I also got to do a book dash book with one of my really good friends. So I got to combine two things, give back and do good work um, with my friend Anya Fenter and um, Muzzy and Helen Moffat, my editor. And that was the book that we did. So in closing, so art is the fire we light against the darkness. It's what we have. And I've been struggling with this a lot lately, where I've been thinking, what is the point of writing a book? What is the point? Like, the world is crumbling. Global warming is hor horrendous. The far right is on the rise. Yeah. What, like, what is writing a story going to do? 
And you know what? It's what I have. It's, it's the one fire that I do have that I can light. And I'm going to a climate engineering conference in May to try and use storytelling powers to help scientists convey some of the stuff that they need to get across to the rest of the world. So do the work. Please, do the fucking work. Yeah. Be kind, to, especially to yourself. Be brave. Look after yourself. And go set some shit alight. Thanks. Thank you.